Hello, and uh, thank you very much for joining us for Wander Into Wellbeing. Uh, we're particularly delighted to be joining the uh, activity timetable that Team Bath have put together to support sort of health activity and wellbeing. And today we are going to be bringing you a toolkit of basic techniques that you'll be able to use to support your wellbeing in these very challenging times. We're going to introduce some top tips and techniques that you can put into practice straight away that should help you to feel better and be able to deal with whatever challenges are coming your way at the moment. We are an organisation called Reason to Be, um, and our aim is to help people to be able to thrive, not just survive, and so to be able to grow and flourish in whatever situation they find themselves in. And because humans are complex and unique, and more than just the sum of their individual parts, we help people to thrive by taking an integrated and holistic view of what it means to be human, but to translate that into simple advice that people can follow. We absolutely believe in people's ability to change, and we've got some good science to help them to be able to do that. My name is Aurea Fellows. I am an occupational psychologist and also a nutritional therapist. And this is my colleague, Keith Goddard. Uh, he is also an occupational psychologist, as well as being a sport and exercise psychologist. And we both have a wide range of experience working with very different people in very different settings, uh, enabling them to dare to dream, whatever that dream might be, but to get what they want uh, out of life. So we're going to uh, start now and, and have a look at some, some top tips around well-being. So ever since uh, coronavirus started, and particularly since the lockdown began, there's been a lot of talk about well-being, and we've been invited to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and, and practicing self-care regularly. But what exactly is well-being? Well, at Reason to Be, we have a, a clear philosophy that well-being isn't just one thing. And in fact, to get really great well-being, we need to be thinking about five different foundations or pillars. And these would be our emotional well-being and our nutritional well-being, social well-being, our physical well-being, and also our mental well-being. But because, as I said, humans are complex and the environment that we're in is constantly changing and very unpredictable, as we're all feeling right now, we also need to think about well-being holistically. Because genuine well-being is in fact a symbiotic system whereby actually supporting our well-being in one area actually helps to drive well-being in all the other areas. So we actually need to think of it as an integrated system which is supporting and reinforcing as a whole. So in terms of today we are going to touch on a few simple pieces of advice from across all five of the pillars or foundations. And we're not expecting you to do everything, but it is about potentially focusing on what's most relevant for you right now uh, from the different areas, and then getting into good habits by practicing those things that are most helpful for you regularly. So we're gonna kick us off uh, with Keith um, giving top tips around our emotional wellbeing. Thanks, Aurea. Hi, everyone. So let's look at some simple but effective tools to help build our emotional well-being. As human beings, we like certainty. And when we don't have certainty, we feel more vulnerable. Things feel out of control or they make us worry. We know the more perceived control a person has, the less anxious or the less stressed they'll feel. That's why controlling the controllables is, a vital, is vital to our psychological well-being. But the one thing that most of us control most of the time is our breathing. This is what we would call our psychological core or a key anchor. Diaphragmatic breathing as it's technically known or belly breathing is a technique used for many purposes. Anything from anxiety reduction to chronic pain relief. And on average, we take about seven to 12 breaths per minute when we're relaxed. So try this. Every hour, pause and move your position. 
So if you've been sitting, stand up. If you're standing, sit down. Lay down if you want to. Walk around. But move your position. Close your eyes and breathe from your belly for just one minute or for about nine to ten breaths. Next episode, we'll demonstrate belly breathing. But until then, give it a go. Get into the habit of taking time to breathe every minute. You can get loads of apps to help you with your breathing. I watch have a breathe app. Um, some people might just want to time themselves on the watch. But what we'd say is get yourself into the habit of reminding yourself every hour to breathe for one minute. At the moment, everything's up in the air. Times are tough. There's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of ambiguity. And everyone will be affected differently. So it is absolutely okay not to know how you feel. This is all new. And it's okay to feel different or new emotions. For many of us, our feelings will be like a ball of wool with many different coloured strands all interwoven together. So just take time to notice. Take time to notice the different emotions you're experiencing. And if you can, name them. But whatever you do, don't grapple with your emotions because they're like a fight. Just notice them. Get comfortable in walking alongside your emotions, but do own them. Notice what might trigger or cause certain emotions, including the ones that are helpful and also the ones that you enjoy experiencing. You can choose to feel or not feel a certain way. It's just difficult at first, but it just takes time and practice. But it is something you can do something about. One thing I've learned about working in the field of well-being is that smiling is underrated. The evidence is there. The physical act of smiling changes the hormones in our system and these in turn make us happy. So in the morning, pick a moment to yourself, perhaps in the shower, perhaps on the loo, making a cuppa and smile. Smile out loud and smile in your head. At night, before you fall off to sleep, get comfy and smile. Sometimes if I've had a bad day, that smile goes away quickly. So I just smile again, out loud and in my head, keeping it there for a little longer each time. Give it a go, you might be pleasantly surprised, but remember, these things take practice. Again, smiling is one of those things that you can control and do it will. Remember, you can use all of these simple but effective tools as part of your hourly recharge, 45 minutes and 15 minutes. This will build and improve your emotional well-being. Aurea, I think you've got some top tips on nutrition next. Absolutely, Keith. So when it comes to thinking about our nutritional well-being, obviously we naturally might start by thinking about the food that we're eating. But actually, um, being well hydrated is actually incredibly important to our well-being. And that's because it basically is fundamental to all of our bodily functions. And in fact, even being slightly dehydrated has a massive impact on both our mental and our physical performance. It is individual exactly how much we need to drink, and it does depend on a number of different factors. But the rule of thumb is it's between two and two and a half litres of water a day. Now, some of that will come from our food, um, but it's a good idea in order to keep yourself fully hydrated to just drink water regularly throughout the day. And uh, right now, um, it's a bit tricky because our eating and drinking habits are maybe very different from what they would be normally. So the thing here is to think about your current environment and to think what you could do to have cues or reminders that will make sure that you are drinking regularly. So where do you need to put your glass or your water bottle? Just think about what will enable you to have that reminder 
to make sure that you're drinking regularly. Then when we come to thinking about the food that we're eating, thanks for that cue, <laughs> Keith. Um, the, the most fundamental thing that we can do to support our nutritional well-being is to eat real food and to really reduce the amount of processed food that we're eating. And this is the one thing I talk to people about most regularly. And the reason for that is that real food is more nutritionally dense. And what I mean by that is, as well as having the energy that we need to keep us going, it also has a higher level of the essential vitamins and minerals that we need to keep the body functioning effectively. And just one example of this would be the mineral magnesium. It's really, really important in terms of our well-being uh, because about 600 different enzymes in the body use magnesium. And so it contributes to um, things like our ability to um, create energy, to muscles to contract, for us to have effective sleep, um, but also to be able to manage stress. But the thing is that a lot of processed foods are very low in magnesium because of the way that food is treated. And the estimates are that in the UK, we are really not getting enough magnesium in the foods that we eat. But if you wanted to get more magnesium, uh, foods such as nuts, particularly Brazil nuts, almonds, cashews, uh, all green vegetables and whole grains, such things like brown rice, would all be great sources of magnesium. Of course, if cooking from scratch every day is, is proving difficult um, for you, especially at the moment, then one of the things that it's a great habit to get into is batch cooking when you have got time. So you can put food away in the freezer for those busier days or make sure that you've got some leftovers for lunch the following day. So when we're eating real food, the other thing that we need to think about is eating the rainbow. And this is basically choosing plant foods that are very different in color. So thinking about actively, consciously picking from that whole color spectrum when we're thinking about the fruit and vegetable that we're including. And this is because that range of colors is a critical way to get all the range of different nutrients um, that we need in our diet. So here you might think about planning your meals around color, thinking about the diversity that you're able to achieve uh, every day or maybe keep track of it every week. And you might even like to challenge yourself to get to 30 different colored plant foods every week. The final thing I just want to touch on in terms of nutrition is also about trying to minimize the amount of sugar that we are taking in. It's really easy uh, when we're finding things hard, when it's stressful, to reach for a sugary snack to make us feel a bit better and give us a lift. But actually in the long run, um, eating a lot of sugar in our diet actually causes us to have less energy and to affect our mood very negatively. Um, it in fact actually takes away some of the nutrients that we, uh, we need in our, in our diet. Now, I'm going to talk more about this in the next session when we're going to dive into the whole issue of blood sugar balance and how important that is to our nutritional well-being. But for now, the message is just to keep sugar and alcohol as an occasional treat or reward rather than that everyday essential. And to be really mindful about when and why you're having these foods in your diet. So look across those different techniques, think about what you can control right now. And also when you've got time to do your small recharge every hour, make sure that you're drinking regularly, that you are thinking about your food across the day um, and seeing what you can do from this element of well-being to support yourself. Now I'm gonna hand back to Keith and Keith is gonna tell us a little bit more about the whole territory of mental well-being. Thanks very much, Aurea. So, we know our brains are very, very complex and powerful bits of kit. They generate thousands of thoughts every hour. The only problem is many of these thoughts are random and we don't ask them to generate the thoughts. So they're done without request. As well, our brains are often working on many problems at once, trying to make sense of our emotions, trying to make sense of new issues, new contexts. So no wonder our head feels like scrambled eggs sometimes or spaghetti, particularly in a context like this where we're trying to deal with a lot of new things. 
wasn't difficult at first, try and think about one thing or try and focus on one train of thought and stay with it. It is difficult and it's a skill. Don't try and grapple with all the other thoughts that are trying to crowd your head. Just gently move those thoughts away and focus on the thought that you've chosen to focus on. You're in charge of your thoughts, not the other way around. We thought life was busy before coronavirus, but it's even more challenging now and even more complex. And we're trying to deal with loads of new things, trying to educate our children, trying to work at home with partners. But take control of your time and structure your week, structure your day, and structure your hours. But be flexible with that, because things will change and they are changing, and things won't go according to plan. While structuring and planning may not be your thing, and some may be averse to it, we know a tad more structure and planning gives us a greater sense of perceived control. And we talked about that a little bit earlier in the emotional part. Structure and planning also allow us to get more done and therefore give us a greater satisfaction of achievement and satisfaction. They also help us to take the anxiety out of our decision making as well. Recharging during the day is a good thing, but it's even more important at the moment. So every hour, split your time with 45 minutes of focused work followed by 15 minutes of recharge time. Now, let's be honest, there's some of us out there that won't be able to focus for 45 minutes for a whole host of reasons. So do what you can do. Do 20 minutes of focused work and five minutes of recharge time, if that's what works. The reality is many of us will feel guilty or lazy in doing this because that 15 minutes or that five minutes time will be seen as downtime. Actually, it will make you more effective in the long run. And at the end of the day, you'll feel way less tired because you're recharging as you go. Giving yourself a brain break allows it to do its stuff. It gives the brain time to absorb what you've just done. It allows the brain to recharge, and especially if you give it a drink occasionally. Reality is, of course, it's easier not to do 45 and 15 minutes. It's easier just to work through the hour. That's your choice. It is within your control. We know most of us try way too hard to keep stuff in our heads, to try and remember things, try and remember the call we've just had, try and remember the to-dos from that. We do this consciously, but also our brain subconsciously tries to remember events and tries to keep find a home for it. Until it finds that home, it will circulate and recycle that information and that event until it can find a home. So make life easy for yourself, make life easy for your brain. Get it out of your head and give it at home. And this is what we would call ink it, don't think it. And some of you may have heard that expression before. A good way to do this is to mind map if people like um, pictures um, or to make lists. And do this with whatever's on your mind. So if you think there's something on your mind, sit down for five or ten minutes and mind map or list it. It doesn't make any difference what you do with that. Just get it out of your head you may not even realise that you've got something on your mind, but you will. So try inking it and thinking it. Your mind will not want to forget something. It'll try and keep it alive. And at night, this will keep you awake. Particularly if you're anxious about something. The chances are you'll be thinking about it and that will keep you awake. So top tip, have a book or a set of post notes and a pen beside your bedside. Put your mind to rest. We mentioned earlier about noticing your emotions. 
we'd also suggest and we find feel it's important to notice your thoughts as well so write any thoughts that you're having down don't leave these techniques until you need them choose to control what you can when you can make them a habit use them and practice them try using some of the techniques in your 15 minutes recharge period every hour Aurea, i think you're going to do some top tips on social well-being so we're at least all talking to each other when all this is over over to you <laughs> yes when it comes to our social well-being obviously we're now all of us at home a lot more than we used to um, except for key workers who are obviously perhaps spending less time at home than they might normally. So one of the things that it's important to do in this disrupted world that we're all living in at the moment is to still think about how we can structure proper social time into both our day and our week. So whilst we're at home with people a lot, maybe more than we're used to, we may be thinking that we're spending a lot of time with our family and with the kids, but a lot of that time might be as co-workers as we share a home office or as teachers and pupils as we try and uh, educate the kids so we also need to think about having time in our day and across our week that we can really connect socially with the people that we're close to who are sharing our environment and that might just be as simple as having meals together uh, making sure that our outside time for exercise is together if you've got a garden spending time outside in the garden with the kids um, or just making sure that we have a chance to kick back and relax and, and connect properly. Uh, and if you can't do it every day, then try to make sure you can do it across the course of the week. But of course, there are loads of other people in our lives, not just those people that we are currently spending lots of time with. So it's a really good idea at the moment as well to think about at least once a day, touching base with someone who's not just in your immediate household, if you're working from home, but thinking about colleagues, friends, obviously uh, family who are elsewhere at the moment, uh, people who we'd normally have a lot of contact with um, who we may be not seeing as much of and just making sure that we keep those connections, that we keep uh, checking in and seeing how people are doing. But there also might be new social networks or groups that it's important for you at the moment to feel connected to. So perhaps if there are other people, all homeschooling kids of a similar age or caring for elderly relatives, when they might not normally be. There might be other networks where you can, you can help support other people, but also get support and guidance from, from others in a way that's really important to you to feel part of a community or a network right now. And the other thing I'm gonna finish by mentioning is just how important it is right now to say thank you, I love you, and I'm sorry, perhaps more than we would normally. So as Keith mentioned under the emotional section, um, it's no idea how we might feel at the moment from one day to the next and sometimes the way that we're feeling can have a real impact on those around us just because we're spending so much more time with them in a small environment so it's really good to recognize that to be conscious of the way perhaps that your emotions are impacting on those people around you and if necessary to say that you're sorry to explain and to say you know how you're feeling but the other thing that's also important in saying thank you and i love you more is because it's also good for, for us as well as for other people. So there's a really important hormone um, called oxytocin that you may have heard of. And what the studies show is that actually by expressing gratitude to our partner, we actually have more of that hormone um, in our own bodies, which actually causes us to feel better connected and a more of an experience of love, even though we're the ones expressing the gratitude. So as we have said with the other areas, take a look across those, all of which are within your control, across the week, if not in every day. So just see what you feel that you can take action on. And again, when you're having your recharge moment, as Keith just mentioned, when you're blocking out a little bit of time each hour, think about how you could do any of those things, even if it's only small. So we're gonna finish with our fifth area, which is physical well-being. And Keith's going to tell us a little bit more about some of the top tips there. Thanks very much, Aurea, again. I'm sure many people watching this or listening to this will be physically active and doing regular exercise. Probably a lot less exercise than we'd want to do and we have been doing. 
Um, but have you noticed in terms of our new current way of working, living and educating, it's way too easy to forget to move? Or with the space you've got, you may struggle with your space to move around. So the question, I guess, is, is do you focus on your physical activity in the day as well as your one hour of allocated exercise outdoor? Talk to a lot of people about back-to-back -back Zoom calls where we're sitting on less than appropriate seating and um, perched on a stool somewhere, sitting in strange places to educate our kids if you've got kids at home. Interestingly, not walking from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting like we would if we're at work. These are just some of the challenges we've got on our physical well-being. And if you're an office worker particularly, we know even before all this, our physical well-being would be affected by how long we sit at desks. So do some simple things that you can control and will actually have quite a big difference on, on how you feel physically and emotionally and mentally. One of the key things is stand more and get up more often. Move position at least every hour. If you're on a Zoom call sitting one, try and move location and stand for the next one. Get yourself a very simple stretching program that you can do for a few minutes at a time. So in between Zoom calls or every hour is you do a few simple stretching exercises. You're probably in a place full of other people. Unfortunately, you may not be, you may be by yourself. But if you're with other people, don't just do your moving and stretching by yourself. Get others to join in. Have a five minute dance break to a favorite family song or friends. When you do get out to exercise, don't forget to mix it up with moderate, intense and strength sessions, if appropriate to your physical and medical status. There are so many ways now on the internet to exercise, so many people that are providing programs across so many different spheres, it, it's almost impossible not to find something that's suitable for you, but mix it up a bit. Vary it during the day, vary it during the week. Do five minutes here, do half an hour there, and get other people involved. And if you're by yourself, get other people involved on FaceTime, on party time, do it socially as well as by yourself. It's not just about physical activity. It's also about your physical environment as well. And your physical environment also is fundamental to supporting your well-being. For some of us, space might be quite tight for us at the moment. Two people who are working at home, perhaps, trying to school one or more children, trying to do exercise, trying to cook, trying to sleep. So many rooms will need to have many uses, I guess, for a lot of people. Be creative and zone the house. Zone it for different times of the day and for different purposes. And if needs be, change what it looks like by moving vases, books around so you've got a different tone to it. Don't forget your daily commute to work. For those of us that aren't home workers, we've been used to going out of the door can we back in the door? So if you can, just do that simple act. If you've got a garden, walk out the door, walk around the garden and come back into work. At the end of the day, leave the house, walk around the garden in the opposite direction and come back home. If you live in a flat, simple act of walking out the door, walk down the corridor and walk back in. That in itself gets us to move, but also gives us a physical change in environment. We also talk about having opening times. If you're in a very crowded space, have opening times for certain parts of the house so you can share, but also all of you get your own private space. If needs be, lock the toilet door and put the busy sign on for five minutes so you can do your breathing, perhaps. Make sure you book it, though. You've probably heard a lot about green space and the importance of it before coronavirus started. It was big before coronavirus, and I would say it's even more important now. So if you're managing to get out on your daily hour, try to get some green space. And for some people, that will be difficult. If you live in a city, 
but try and find out areas where there are green space even if it's just some trees some flower beds or if you're lucky enough make sure that you take a walk through fields rather than on roads whatever's safe and whatever's appropriate for you whilst you're out in green space make sure you engage in it it's very easy to go out for a one hour stomp for your physical activity come back and you'll feel physically better but did you engage with the environment while you're out did you look did you listen did you smell did you touch where appropriate it makes a big big difference on our well-being if you're struggling to get out and get to green space then try and bring it in very easy but be creative in the use of technology websites videos and movies to try and bring nature and green space in even the screen servers you use if possible may not be possible but the use of indoor plants a good tip particularly tying in with nutritional is to try and grow some herbs if you can it may not be possible but a little bit of compost in egg containers with a few seeds bought over the internet so one you'll have herbs but also the smell the touch and used in cookery so i guess do what you can with what you've got be creative and controlling the controllables and remember to pepper your recharge 15 minutes through the day with different physical activities but also think about across your week as well schedule some things in but be flexible with that and remember to green space it so i'm going to hand over to aurea now for some concluding comments thanks keith so as you've seen what we've wanted to cover today was our top tips across all five of the areas or pillars of well-being as we describe them so that you could pick something that's most relevant for you hopefully from each of those and then combine them in a way that will make them more mutually reinforcing and as Keith's just been talking about there as well, also thinking about how across your day you can start to practice those things in a way which is all about little and often. So trying to make sure that rather than focusing on one thing, we cover all of the territories, we do them in ways that we can fit into our schedule and we can get into good habits because we're doing them regularly. So we are going to, in future sessions, dive into more of those topics in a bit more detail. Um, but uh, we are just going to close off for now and Keith's going to tell you a little bit more about what's coming up soon. Thanks Aria. So in our next episode we're going to have two slots so we're going to focus on breathing techniques and expand a little bit more on diaphragmatic and belly breathing but also different ways you can do that and then we're going to have a separate session on nutritional well-being. So until then it's goodbye from here. And it's goodbye from him. Bye.